Thanks so much. It's always wonderful to he be here and to catch up on everything that's new with Highwire. And uh, I was telling uh, John I've been particularly interested this morning because I do come from the publishing side of things to see how uh, the manuscript transfer and, and off-campus access is working. It's a, it's a great opportunity. Um, as John said, I'm, I'm Heather Staines, the Director of Partnerships for Hypothesis. I've been with Hypothesis about 18 months. Um, and what I want to tell you a little bit about today are some practical uh, use cases. So if you haven't heard about Hypothesis, we are a nonprofit open source technology company, which I say is either two strikes against us or two things in our favor, depending upon where you lie on the, the open spectrum. Um, some of our funders are indicated there across the bottom of the slide. And I really like to point out um, you know, when I talk to publishers that as a nonprofit, it's written into our charter that we cannot be acquired. So you will not wake up tomorrow and find we've been surprise purchased by uh, Elsevier. Who else is there, really? Um, so when we look at uh, the way that annotation may work on the web, we think of it in the form of different layers. Uh, we've become attuned over the years to think that something needs to be completely public to be worthwhile. Uh, but really, um, it's not the case. And a number of conversations can go on over one document uh, and taking place in different layers. So if you can see in the slide here, there may well be a public discussion happening on a document. But underneath that, there may well be uh, completely private notes being taken, uh, private journal clubs, student groups, some of the things that John mentioned, as well as um, expert community or added value that's presented by the publisher. Uh, one thing I'm not uh, going to be talking about today is um, our collaboration with, with BioArchive. I probably should have put a, a slide in, but I was talking to, to Claire from uh, COB earlier, and one of the really interesting things that they're looking at is the opportunity that um, societies may have their own annotation layers visible on top of the preprint servers. So that's really relevant to what we talked about this morning. So if you want to hear more about that, just ask me later. So last week, we celebrated our 3.3 millionth annotation. Uh, about 20% of those are completely private notes. About 20% are completely public. And you can explore them. They're sent to Crossref uh, for event data. And they're indexed by Google. But 50% are happening in collaboration groups. So I loved all of the references to different types of collaboration that have happened here at the meeting. So one of the things that we think is really essential at Hypothesis is that the collaboration occurs on the publisher version of record. So if you're looking at um, ways to add value and differentiate content that's accessed legally on your site versus um, content that's not legally accessed, um, adding value and adding community through annotation is one, is one possibility to look at there. Um, once your annotations are all accessible in one key point, you can keep returning to your articles. You can collaborate on them with colleagues. So we tell publishers it does increase engagement, increased usage. Um, we felt when we started to work with publishers that uh, if we're going to make annotation visible by default, publishers wanted it to be part of the journal experience. They wanted their branding to show through. They wanted it to be clear which groups were considered authoritative by them. And so each one of the publisher groups that I'll show you does have an activity page where all of those annotations coalesce. Um, publishers are completely in control over who can make annotations and who can read them. And we believe that uh, publishers own their own annotations. So you can always get them out through an API if you want to do text and data mining, or if you want to repurpose them for marketing uh, and the like, you can do that. So publisher groups, um, again, this was this, something initiated uh, by a collaboration with eLife that we did. Um, and there's really two main types of groups. Um, we, one group is called open groups, and anyone can participate in that. Uh, the other type of group, and I'll show you some use cases um, in this space as well, is what we call restricted group. So everyone can see the annotations, but only those designated by the publisher can actually create annotations. And interestingly, you can have more than one layer depending upon what purpose you're trying to achieve so that it can be clear which annotations are made by the author, by the journal staff, versus uh, which are made by readers and you know, other interesting folks. And again, all of that is branded and moderated by the publisher. Um, we can connect to publisher accounts. Uh, some, some publishers want to add annotation to learn more about their readers. Uh, particularly, this is of interest to open access uh, publishers. And so uh, if there already are accounts that you're using or personalization features, we can connect to that. Um, and we can do some configurations to make the client fit in well with your site. 
So the first type of group I mentioned is open groups. This is a couple of screenshots. Um, and excuse me, eLife did a nice blog post about six weeks after the service went live and looked at about six different ways that they found their readers were using annotation. They had the authors go ahead and seed their publications with some interesting information, updates, and the like. Um, so you can go and, and, and check that out. But I, I was really excited to see uh, this particular use. You can tell by the big red banner ad across the top that this article has a correction. But the eLife staff actually used what we call a page note, which is an article level annotation, to add the information of what was actually uh, included with the correction, um, as well as the citation and the DOI. So it's not a substitute for releasing uh, your own correction, but it's a way to make information you know, just a little bit more visible to readers. Um, the second type of group I mentioned is the restricted groups. Um, and the first restricted group went live in April. Uh, we announced it um, earlier in June. And this is for the American Diabetes Association. So they had a very specific use case. Every January, they publish an update to the medical standards of care in diabetes. And they wanted the ability to add updates without waiting for that yearly cycle to come around again. So we created um, a group for them that is world readable to anyone who comes to the article. But in order to put annotations into it, you have to be part of the ADA staff. So this is a, a, a screenshot of their group. You can see the ADA branding at the top and the annotations along the side. And I just wanted to zoom in on one of the annotations. And they did, you know, they knocked this out of the park. They did an amazing job. Um, each one of the annotations uh, has the date that it's posted, the date that the Publications Committee approved it, as well as a suggested citation. So if you would like to cite the, uh, the annotation, um, you can do so. Uh, so they really treated these as first-class research objects. Uh, so some of these annotations link to other ADA publications. Some of the links even just go further down in the article for ease of access. Uh, some link to external resources. And then they've added some interesting tables and, and charts and the like. Uh, I mentioned that each one of these groups has what we call an activity page or a group page. So if you want to see all of the articles that have been annotated by ADA, you can do that in one location. And in one click, you can get uh, to the article. And it'll actually scroll you down to the part that's been updated. Another example of a restricted group is a project that we did with Syracuse University's Qualitative Data Repository. Um, it's also uh, in conjunction with Cambridge University Press. And it's called the Annotation Transparency Initiative. I really wanted to put on this slide that we were shortlisted for the ALPS uh, Innovation Awards, but I had to send the slides in on Friday. And I wasn't allowed to say anything until Monday. So uh, imagine that you see a little notification there on the slide. Um, so what, uh, so this is the qualitative data repository. So it's not maybe the data that springs to our mind immediately. It's transcripts and interviews and the like. So they wanted to take the citations in different articles and actually allow the authors to add more context as well as to link to the data repository where uh, folks could request access to the underlying data. So um, in addition to um, adding those links, the authors can put in information about the source that maybe uh, didn't quite make the cut to the article. The authors can add updates there. Uh, there's a place for doing translations, uh, linking to original sources. So it actually takes um, a citation link and makes it a lot more valuable um, throughout the editorial and publication process. The first dozen articles just happened to be done uh, through Cambridge University Press. Um, so they actually launched the group. But there's an additional um, 12 articles that have been annotated. And we're in the process of speaking with those other publishers uh, to make the group visible on their pages as well. Um, annotation is also being used in, in peer review. Um, again, so it fits right into some of the conversations that we've had today. Uh, rather than getting that long document back that says on page 5, paragraph 4, line 2, I disagree. And then you're sent on a, on a goose hunt to try to find what, what is there. Um, so there's been a lot of interest. This is an uh, e-journal press integration, but we're speaking with all of the other manuscript submission systems, including uh, Bench Press as well. Now, these are the examples that I think are incredibly interesting because they were not foreseen uh, by us at Hypothesis. So Springer Publishing, uh, as, uh, as Dan mentioned yesterday, recently launched a new site uh, which, which has all of their content on, a beautiful site. And they were adding uh, books and batches of you know, a couple of hundred at a time, uh, more than 8,000 chapters. 
And so they wanted to look at the XML and make sure that it was perfect before they, they switched the site to live. So they created a group that included their production department, their copy editors, and some of their offshore vendors. And they actually went through and, um, and marked these changes um, on the site. Um, it's probably hard to see here on this activity page, but they made more than 10,000 annotations in the two months that this particular batch of, of books was being considered. Um, so we're now working with them on a little case study, uh, what kinds of features would have made uh, this more useful and what they might try again the next time around, perhaps like using, using tags to indicate certain types of changes and the like. And this is just a little screenshot of um, you know, one of the corrections there on top of their site and uh, the colleague coming in and letting uh, the original annotator know that it had been fixed. So we were really excited. Um, if you can view it in the browser, you can annotate it. Um, another uh, project which was, was really um, exciting when I learned about it from, from Deborah Plavin uh, was the American Society of Microbiology. So they were in the process, um, and this was, I think it was winter time, of um, getting ready to migrate um, 15 journals to JCOR. Um, I think it might, be, maybe it's even more journals than that, but I think that, that. So they knew as a result that a number of the pages on their site were going to have to change. So maybe, you know, in days gone by, they would have printed out these pages, marked them up with pens and sticky notes, handed them around, and then they would have landed on the desk of some poor colleague who would be responsible for sorting out that mess. Well, what they decided to do instead um, was to uh, go in and create an annotation group and actually add these suggested changes, links, uh, ask each other questions right on top of the pages um, in situ. Uh, so we're, we're in the process of writing a case study up with them uh, to uh, kind of talk about what might be useful to add into the project. And this is just um, a screenshot from their group so you can see the types of pages that they knew were going to have to change, the submit your paper change, the licensing change, proprietary rights notice, and the members of the, of the group there on the right. Um, so it was, uh, again, very exciting to hear about that project. A couple of other um, quick use cases, uh, ISMTE, uh, in preparation for their annual meeting, they have a poster uh, proposal process. So they created a peer review for these poster proposals. Uh, they named the folks in the group, um, you can't really see it on this page, but they, they have reviewer one, reviewer two, reviewer three, and they annotated on top of these proposals. Uh, and then at the end of the process, the, the group was opened up to the individual authors so the authors could see feedback um, right on their proposal. Um, a couple of other ideas which um, were just brought to me recently, and I'd love to see uh, how they're going to play out. Um, sales reps visiting uh, campus who used to take the big heavy print textbook with all their stickies so they could show their examples can now transfer those examples into annotation cards and actually share that um, not only while they're there on the campus call, but later on by sharing a link to the annotation group so that um, all of these use cases will be well in hand on campus. Um, another idea, um, which actually Angela Cochran uh, came up with a couple of weeks ago, she said a lot of their um, journals at ASCE give a prize every year for the best article. And she said each one of the journals does it differently. You know, some of them print it out, some of them you know, do it in like a Google Doc. And she said, I'm going to see if they might be willing to put together a little group. That way they can each see each other's notes right on top of the article. And when it gets down to selecting the best article, maybe we'll actually share it and publish the feedback with the article um, at the time of the award. And just one more thing, um, you know, in terms of examples that I want to mention, and the, uh, the neuroscience uh, information framework that uh, was referenced this morning, um, these are research resource identifiers, uh, which are key for reproducibility. If you need to know which stem cell line of mice was used or uh, where a particular reagent was purchased, uh, these are numbers that are typed into papers and they resolve to a number of different external databases. We have a group out of University of California, San Diego, and they created this account called Cybot. And if you open up a paper and it has these RRIDs included, it will pop up the information that you ordinarily would have to go away from the article to get in the form of an annotation card on the side. 
Um, each one of the RRIDs is tagged, so if you come across something that's particularly relevant to your uh, work, you can click on that and see maybe what other papers have actually used either that same stem cell, stem cell line or uh, that reagent, for example. So it's, um, it's, we call it auto-generated but human-curated, which I think is also fitting with the, the AI discussions uh, earlier today. So in terms of, um, of analytics, we provide um, robust analytics about how content is being used, um, private, uh, public, uh, any auto-generated um, uh, analytics, uh, and then after launch, if a publisher adds a group, we can let you know, um, you know who's, who's annotating in the group and who's continuing to annotate, um, either in the public layer or um, in a more private uh, space. Um, we provide a detailed number of annotation and new annotators uh, by month, as well as a number of total registrants. I always like to highlight um, why annotation is different than commenting, and we have heard, I think, more than once today how commenting has taken off in some circumstances, not in others, um, so it's, it's, a, it's maybe an art more than a science. Um, you know, when we do think of commenting, these articles are individually stranded on their pages. There's no one place you can go that says, show me all of the, the, the comments. Well, with the annotation groups, you can see that. Um, earlier this year, when PubMed Commons uh, removed commenting from their site, uh, we were asked if we could rescue these uh, annotations. Um, so we did. We created uh, uh, them as page notes. Uh, we, we worked with Europe PubMed Central and, and PubMed Central in the U.S. to add DOIs to the uh, annotations and also to tag them with their PubMed IDs. Uh, I should have a slide for this. I apologize, you don't. But now there's a collection of 7,000 annotations that you can actually go in and look. And I've looked at many of them. They're quite thoughtful. So even if uh, compared to the number of um, items on PubMed Central, it wasn't a large number that had annotations, now they can be looked at as a corpus, and you can glean uh, a lot of interesting information from that. Um, another big difference uh, between annotations and comment is really around the collaboration uh, factor. Um, again, we hyper-focus on the public, but if you had the opportunity to add a tool to your site that would be useful for your researchers in their day-to-day -day collaboration uh, and make it simpler for them to annotate without creating an account, uh, wouldn't you want to do that, even if you weren't going to necessarily be able to see uh, what they are annotating on? By document and by date and by part of document, we can provide additional information on engagement. And finally, um, uh, in terms of the difference, is persistence. Um, each annotation has a unique persistent web address. Um, we tend to think of the, the internet in the form of page level URLs because that's what we've had. Well now, one URL can have a potential infinite number of sub addresses underneath it that refer to items in it. And the most exciting thing is you don't have to do anything to make this work. You don't have to re-tag your content, you don't have to semantically enrich it. It just works so you can go backwards on your content and you can go forwards on it. So it gets um, really exciting, and um, all of the annotations that come, uh, of course, are available via the API. Uh, in February 2017, the W3C approved annotation as a web standard. Um, so, you know, what does this mean? Well, we think, uh, in terms of interoperability for the future, that this is a foundational development. So. Um, if everyone operates in accordance with the standard, um, uh, Andre's here from Paperhive, and I'm really excited that they operate in accordance with the standard. Um, in future, just like you tell your browser which is your preferred search engine, you'll be able to tell your browser which annotation client you are using. And if we all operate in accordance with the standard, public annotations that I make um, should be able to interact with public annotations that you make, even though we're using different services. Just like we can email each other today. We don't have to have 20 different email accounts. So we're really looking forward to hypothesis to this interoperable future um, that uh, can, uh, can be very exciting and, and robust for everyone. So just to sum up, um, at Hypothesis, we want the publishers to be completely in control of the, how annotation might appear on their site. Uh, so who, who reads it and who writes it? The examples that I gave today are world readable. They're intended to give information to, to readers and researchers. But I have had um, societies say, hey, we'd love to do some annotations that are only visible to our members. Uh, and that's definitely possible. We can scope one group to your publication site and to your member site and connect with your member accounts. Uh, publishers have full moderation as well as control over the behavior and the look and feel of the client. 
um, and they can uh, have multiple annotation layers to meet different needs. Everything is available through the API, so if you need to port your annotations out to another service at any time, uh, you can do so or use them for research purposes. Uh, and finally, you know, enabling an annotation tool can facilitate uh, research uh, amongst a number of people. We have 155,000 Hypothesis users uh, today, and we're excited to uh, see how that builds out in the future. And that's it. Six seconds left. <laughs> Come on up to see uh, uh, what Q&A we have. Um, I don't know whether uh, many of you uh, have uh, a struggle every now and then to e explain to your parents what you do uh, for your job. Uh, Heather just gave this presentation in front of her mother, which I think is pretty amazing. <laughs> Thank you for being so with later us. Later on, you're going to have to explain what I do for my job. <laughs> I've tried it multiple times with my mother, and it's never worked. Just people listen to you? <laughs> um, I wanted to uh, add one uh, use case. It's not an actual one that, that uh, is in production. It's one that came up in a, a meeting uh, I had about two months ago with uh, uh, the uh, publishing group at one of the uh, large societies in the US. Uh, the editors of their, uh, their research journals were seeing uh, a number of inquiries coming in uh, about images that had been published in papers several years ago. Uh, and these were essentially challenges to the, the quality of the, the science uh, that was being presented in the images. Not exactly fraud, but misinterpretation. Uh, and what the editors were wanted to do was avoid having to essentially start up a uh, a whole editorial cycle around uh, correction, clarification, concern, retraction, uh, and instead they were wondering whether uh, annotation could be offered to the authors to annotate the images to address the concerns that had been raised. Uh, and I thought that was a, a that, that clicked for me is annotation can solve specific <laughs> problems that you as publishers and as editors are encountering in workflow. And we should not be thinking about it as, as just uh, you know, discuss uh, and e-letters and comments. Uh, we really should start to focus on the, the individual use cases. And I think uh, Heather did a good job of, of showing a number of those. So, you know, they're made up of these, these capabilities, uh, uh, moderation, uh, uh, groups of, of various sorts where you can have private write, but world read, and, and other combinations of write and read. Uh, and I think that's, that's pretty fundamental. Um, the ability to style it now, uh, uh, this is one of the big advances in the last year, so that, that it can look like part of your journal, as opposed to, oh, somebody's put a, a browser extension on my page. Uh, I think that's, a, that's actually turns out to be pretty important uh, to connect the, the pieces together. So I think uh, there's, there's been some real progress here in the, in the last uh, uh, year or so. Uh, questions uh, that you have for any of us? Uh, why don't we start from the front and go to the back? Oh, I, I should, uh, uh, do you want to introduce yourself in case some people haven't met you? Uh, yeah, so um, Andre, Andre from Paperhive. And uh, I guess I just wanted to add one more use case uh, to the list here, because uh, that was also really interesting for us to see. Um, so, and first of all, in, in general, it's really, really important that um, people have uh, some, some kind of goal to achieve with annotations. Like if you just put something out there and um, wait people to annotate, it's not going to happen. But if you tell people um, how to use it, um, or if they actually want to use it for a specific, uh, for achieving a specific goal, then they really do it. And one of those use cases we have seen is in e-learning, so we have uh, a couple of books, uh, textbooks uh, published by Springer Nature where uh, uh, students are invited by the lecturers and uh, they can then ask their questions that they would otherwise ask in uh, office hours or something and um, they can do so right within the, in the lecture and interact with other students directly and uh, sometimes the lecturer comes in, answers the question, sometimes even the authors come in, some things were really surprising there 
and I think this e-learning case is really, really interesting. Yeah, so that, that was just one more use case I wanted to add there. That's, that's, a, that's a good extension of uh, one of the first use cases I saw, uh, which was this, uh, before we had W3C standards for annotation, there was a site called Rap Genius, uh, which uh, you know, essentially you looked at it and you said, oh my God, this, this actually is clarifying rap lyrics. Uh, people were, were posting rap lyrics and, and uh, pe others were commenting on them and essentially explaining them, uh, correcting them, uh, and you even had the artists themselves going in uh, to address some of the claims that they wanted to, to change. And uh, what ta told me that this application, the framework of commenting, was going to take off was that the site became uh, a general tool for students to use to talk about the works they were reading in their classes. In other words, having nothing to do with rap. Uh, there were parts of the Bible there, Shakespeare, everything, and students were just saying this is a general annotation framework. Students just got this so quickly. Uh, and that, that's, I think, what we're now seeing is, okay, now the rest of us are catching up. Yeah, our education director actually was at Genius before he came yep. to Hypothesis. Um, sadly, last year, uh, Genius announced that they were going back and just focusing on music videos. So there's a question out there as to how long the integrations, the, the annotations that are on other sites are going to be up. So we've done a little experiment, and we can actually rescue those you know, if need be. But it's, uh, it is pretty cool. Yeah. Questions? Go ahead. Um, if you're using annotation to um, post disconfirming evidence or to challenge findings, how does the moderation work? Because there is an implication that you need some ex topic expertise. Mm -hmm. And what, what's the role of the authors uh, yeah. in, in that? Pro yeah. same, same question as your, as your rap question, really. Yeah, so um, you know, publishers have, uh, as, as Andre mentioned, it's important that you have um, something you're trying to achieve. Um, in most of the cases where uh, these open annotation layers will be enabled, um, so uh, eLife, for example, you need to have an ORCID to authenticate um, some work that we're doing for the preprint servers and for you know, Elsevier and Wiley. You need to have um, an ORCID before you can participate in a conversation. Now, in reality, we know that you, know, you can get an ORCID. Um, uh, we had e eLife actually presented at our uh, user group meeting uh, earlier this month, and they did have one instance of someone who'd created a, a pseudonym uh, ORCID to add annotations to their site. Um, and some people said, wow, ORCID's it's really made it now when folks are using it to like, gain the site. But um, you know, enabling sort of a higher threshold. Uh, another um, example is requiring real name. When Hypothesis, before we got into the publishing space, um, you know, it supports you know, any type of pseudonym and for confidentiality, particularly around, among reporters who are using it, it's, um, it can be uh, essential. But eLife wanted um, to enable real, real names, so we had to add a field for that. And the publisher can you know, set certain requirements uh, to participate, and, and we think that that's really key. Um, yeah, I can add something to that. Um, so we have a very open approach to this. Um, uh, however, like if, if uh, something needs to be removed from the platform because it's like uh, threats or something like that, we, we of course have to do that. But everything else that is maybe just a heated discussion, um, that's not something we would remove. We, we won't censor anything on, on Paperhive, and I think you have the same approach. Yeah, so um, I, should, I should clarify. So if anything is made in the public hypothesis channel, um, there is a moderation flag, and our support team you know, will look at it. And we have community standards that are posted. So certainly if something is, is, is spam or you know, auto-generated or it's not even it's not scholarly uh, annotation, you know, that will be hidden. Um, but for our publishers, it's really in accordance with whatever their standards are. Um, we get asked sometimes whether you, things could be voted up or voted down. And we talked to a project called the Coral Project uh, about six weeks ago, and they had a re they had a really well thought out uh, moderation program there, and they said that they they had a like button, but they didn't have a dislike button because they said a lot of times if someone just disagrees with what's said there, they'll dislike it, and it's not an indication necessarily of of, of quality. So you can you can vote something up, uh, or you can vote something neutral, but you can't vote something down. But, but in, in in publisher groups, the publisher can have publisher, moderation. Yeah. So before anything goes yeah. up. 
you can yeah, see you have, it. Yeah, you have moderation. But, um, you also can see either if you want to have the, the API, you can be notified that something's been annotated, or within the publishing group pages that I showed, you can essentially see real-time annotations if you want to go and check all of them. You can do that. Yeah, but I think it's really important uh, to say that, that there's nothing like being censored in the public channels. Uh, so we would eventually probably hide some comments if they fall below a certain threshold or something. But um, in the end, you would be allowed to say, OK, I want to see everything. So we want to make it as easy and as uh, comfortable for the user to um, uh, to use Paperhive or the annotations, but um, if the user really wants to see everything, they can do so. Ellen? Um, are you aware of any annotations that may have led to retractions or corrections? So in the academic space, um, it's 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 fairly early days yet, um, but uh, you know we're keeping our eye on that. But I will say um, there's a there are a group of climate scientists who use um, hypothesis called climate feedback, and so what they do is annotate usually mainstream media articles, um, occasionally uh, scientific articles, and they have been successful in getting uh, uh, places like the Guardian or the Atlantic to do. Um, amendments or corrections, if not, you know, retractions in that space, that's a little bit less common. But um, the idea, one of the ideas um, around these groups is that you can have a community of interest around a particular um, topic, you know, maybe immigration, for example, and when there are um, articles that come out, you can do, you know, fact checking with the hopes of pressuring places to be more accurate in their reporting. So we're, we're keeping an eye to see if that will spill over into the scientific space. Uh, there was a question probably in the back. Kevin. So one of the use cases I can see is in implementing hypothesis on articles of submission within the submission system for peer review. Have you got anybody talking to you? Is that something you're thinking about at all? Yeah, so we, um, I showed the one slide from the eJournal Press integration, and what they've done is to take the, the client um, and integrate it to their dashboard. So I think in the form of the larger submission systems, it will probably be um, work that they do uh, to bring hypothesis in to, to make it fit better. But we do have a journal um, that's on the, the open journal systems platform, the PKP uh, sponsored version. It's, it's a humanities journal called Murmuration which try to say that in a presentation, it's very dangerous. Um, and what they do, they have a very open process. So um, they created, in effect, uh, a restricted group that includes the author, the reviewers, and the journal editor. And then once they have established that the, uh, the, 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 the feedback you know, is sort of settled, then that is open um, to the public. So we, we have the blog post ready to launch it. They keep saying July 1st, but they haven't they haven't said to, to release it on Friday or Monday yet, but um, one of the things that we enabled uh, to make that more straightforward is to be able to use the API to create groups, um, because certainly it's unworkable, it's unscalable if, if it has to be a manual process. So with the API, um, it'll be able to be integrated, um, sort the authors and the reviewers into groups. Uh, the one thing that we don't actually offer directly now, which we'll probably work on next year, is being able to blind the reviewers um, and make things confidential from the author. So right now, if it's an open or community uh, peer review, you absolutely can do it. Um, and some of those uh, more uh, specific roles are coming later. Same is true for Paperhive, basically. <laughs> uh, any other uh, questions? All right. Uh, thank you. I hope that, to hear from you about your interesting. Oh, uh, there are two up there. Uh, I asked, uh, so annotations can have DOIs? They're down here, two of you. Yeah, Crossref has um, a new type of DOI that they announced um, last fall, um, and it's, I don't want to call it a, a catch-all, but it's, it's, right now it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, broad. It can include things like uh, peer reviewer um, uh, remarks, um, as well as annotation and a, and a couple of other, I think, use cases anticipated. Um, the ADA example that I showed, um, I think that would be a really good candidate for, for a DOI. So some of the questions we have with publishers and with Crossref is, well, who would apply for that DOI? And the, in the ADA use case, it's probably fairly straightforward that the ADI, ADA would request um, DOIs for those. Uh, but in some other use cases, an author might want to request a DOI in the event that they want to cite something. So that's, um, that's definitely coming, uh, coming soon. Uh, but there are many, uh, many types of annotations which 
probably don't require a, a DOI. So we have to have a little more, you know, kind of uh, fine tuning around that. Next question. Or it's up there. Yeah. So um, you can get a hypothesis account and use it anywhere on the web by using a plugin or a, or a bookmarklet. But the publishers who want to enable hypothesis on their sites will add a line of JavaScript if you just want the free version, or um, a little bit more robust JavaScript, which, which Highwire has already uh, in in integrated into jCore. So that removes the need for the end user to have to have anything or even have heard of Hypothesis at all. So the examples that I showed, uh, both the open groups and the restricted groups, it's seen by default. This is why it's so critical that the control be in the publisher's hands. Because if they're going to see it on your content, you want to absolutely be, be in control of that. Um, so it's seen by everyone, but if you wanted it uh, maybe only to be seen, we, we have some publishers that are saying, well, maybe we only want subscribers to see the annotations. Um, you know, that's something that is definitely uh, possible, but you know, we always say, well, is your goal to get more subscribers, in which case maybe you want to let everyone see it, but you can only participate if you're a subscriber. Similarly, in the member situation, you know, if you want to attract more members, maybe you want folks to see it. But um, you can fine tune it uh, as, as, as to who sees it and know you don't have to have an account. If you want to create um, annotations and we're using third party accounts like uh, the, the uh, eLife example and some of the Highwire publishers that will be coming on later this year, you don't ha they don't have to create a separate account. If they have an account with your publication already um, or they're using your member database uh, to get people into the site, um, we will auto-generate a hypothesis account based on an identifier which you give us, which could be an ORCID, could be a member ID number, it could be anything. They don't need to create a separate account. We only know that piece of information about them though, so that, uh, that shadow account can only be used on your content. Um, but we want to make it possible for them to connect to a, 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 an actual fully uh, formed hypothesis account if they want to use it everywhere on the web. Now, if you don't have any accounts on your site, you can still get all of the, um, the functionality, the branding, the moderation with hypothesis accounts in the back end. There's just that one extra step where they make an account. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.